Okay, all right, good. All right, so um, third speaker um, today uh, is Sarah Mills uh, from the University of Michigan. Um, and so Sarah works in the Graham Sustainability Institute uh, at the University of Michigan. Um, she's also the senior project manager for something called Close Up Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy. Um, and her research considers how energy development impacts rural communities and in turn how the state and local policies facilitate or hinder, hinder renewable energy development. And in a practical sense, um, she goes around the state interacting with communities and looking to see in what cases are developments of, of renewable energy accepted, right? And easy and where, where does it get hard? And so uh, thanks, thanks, sir, for, for joining us. Um, and we invited you here knowing you knew nothing about nuclear, but that was the point, right? Um, so maybe just simple overview question for you. You know, you're engaging with these mid, mid, Midwest, Midwest communities as they're considering added wind and solar resources. Do you see commonalities, meaning successful approaches or unsuccessful approaches um, that may be uh, lessons that the nuclear developers could use? Um, and this goes to things like size of projects, the local decision-making structures, um, when you start to engage and how with local leaders. So yeah, any insight you could give us there on the solar deployments that you think would be useful for the nuclear community? Great. Well, yes, uh, I'll do my best in terms of uh, what this might mean for nuclear. Um, but first, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really honored to be such a, among such uh, esteemed scholars. I am a scholar, but as Todd mentioned, a very applied one, um, and spend a lot of my time in communities um, getting their questions and understanding their concerns when they are being asked to host a wind or solar project, and then bringing that back and trying to quantitatively see patterns in which communities are really concerned, <laughs> are willing hosts uh, or unwilling hosts of this energy infrastructure and which, um, you know, uh, see that their community is a good fit for wind and solar. So I will draw upon that um, and do what I can to kind of translate that for nuclear, but really welcome all of your thoughts about what this might mean. In doing this, I want to acknowledge that uh, there are clearly differences. We're talking about energy infrastructure, but differences between nuclear and renewables. And you may wonder, like, what am I talking about? There's very high support for renewable energy across demographics, across geographies, across the political spectrum. Um, uh, and that's true on paper. But when push comes to shove, when projects are proposed, um, there is actually quite a bit of contention in many communities. Um, and there are a number of renewable projects that are being, um, that are being rejected. And, and to be clear, in most states, the decision about siting of those projects isn't, you know, clearly federally regulated. It's, it's often um, given to local governments to decide. And so this can be really problematic because of the footprint of renewable energy projects. A wind farm can be 100,000 acres. It can span that size. And so often it crosses county boundaries. And so um, this idea of community acceptance is really important to developers um, because they've got often not just get one group on board, but multiple local governments on board. So from that work and kind of the uh, uh, some additional research that I've done trying to understand the patterns, I'm going to talk about three. Um, three different findings from renewable energy and then kind of connect them to what I think it might mean for nuclear energy. Uh, I didn't actually prepare this at all. You asked Todd about size of projects and I've got a project right now trying to understand that. And there is no, it, <laughs> there is no sense that bigger is worse <laughs> in people's minds or more contentious. Um, that um, more important actually about how a community responds to a wind or solar project is whether or not they think that the proposal fits in their community, um, in their vision of what that place is all about. So um, again, most of my work is in rural areas because that's where there's enough land for siting big wind and solar projects. And what we find is that there's less opposition to wind energy in working landscapes. Um, than there is in landscapes where people live for aesthetic reasons. So to a farmer, um, renewable energy development is just another way to make money off their land. Um, and farming communities 
are tend, tend to be pretty supportive of renewable energy. But it's in communities where people move to enjoy the scenery, maybe in retirement, or maybe it's um, like a bedroom community on kind of the ex-urban fringe where people live there to enjoy the scenery, but at least prior to COVID, we're commuting to jobs in the city. Um, those are the communities where wind energy tends to be more contentious because it is a change to the landscape. Modern wind turbines are 500 feet tall. Um, and, and that change to the landscape, you know, no amount of economic benefit associated with that project or environmental benefit that's promised as a, pro as a result of that project is going to make up in their minds the change to that landscape. So that's, that's kind of lesson number one is about the change in the landscape and the fit with the landscape. Um, the second finding that's common throughout kind of understanding community response to renewable energy is that communities really care about the local impacts, positive and negative, rather than the global impacts. And this is where you see the disconnect between people generally saying, yeah, we're in favor of renewables, and then you see responses when it's proposed in their backyards. Um, they often base their decisions um, largely for especially these large renewable energy projects. It's really an economic proposition to these rural communities. They're generating far more power than they will use locally. Um, you, many of the rural communities don't aren't necessarily hosting this infrastructure for you know, local environmental reasons. It is really, this is an economic opportunity in the taxes that are paid and the landowner payments that are made for hosting wind and solar turbines. And so what they really care about is whether, you know, the, the positives that would come with it outweigh the negatives. And what we found is that over-promising <laughs> the economic benefits or kind of sweeping the, the, the potential negative impacts on tourism or something under the rug is really detrimental in the long term. Um, so as a tangible example, um, I've studied in depth the number of wind farms specifically in Michigan. And in one, the wind developer was talking about all the jobs in renewable energy. And there are lots, but many of them are in construction and they're bringing in the special construction crews from outside the community. So, so once the wind farm is operational, there's not tons. And in that community, the residents were like, this wind farm didn't produce any jobs, even though there were still some maintenance, ongoing maintenance jobs. In another wind farm community, the wind developer didn't promise jobs at all. They didn't talk about jobs when they were talking to the community about hosting the project. And the couple of operational O&M jobs that, that, um, that ended up coming along with the project were seen as a huge benefit to that community, an unexpected benefit. And so the kind of lesson here again is that focusing on what are the very local, you know, impacts and benefits um, is, is, is really important to communities and not to oversell um, the benefits or to undersell the potential negatives that might come. And then the third finding that's, that's really pervasive in the kind of community acceptance literature for renewable energy is, a, is that procedural justice really matters in understanding community response. So operationally, like what this means when I'm going and talking to communities is that a full range of stakeholders felt like they had a say in shaping the project and that their concerns were taken seriously, both, a, a lot of the literature puts it on the energy developer, which I think is right, so that the energy developer is taking their concerns seriously, but also the local government officials, that they are being listened to by the people that at the end of the day will make the decision about whether um, the project can be built. Um, what, like I said, this is something that's really common in the literature, but one of the things that I and a colleague were able to find is that that sense, the attitudes about procedural justice are important, not just in the short term in getting the project built, but they carry over into the future. 
People don't just learn to live with wind turbines, that how they feel particularly about the fairness of the process shapes how they feel about that project years into the future. And that has really big implications in the wind industry if you want to go back and repower those wind turbines with new technologies. But it's also really important for referrals where potential host communities will go to the existing wind farms to learn about them. And that's, I think, where um, this understanding of procedural justice will be really important as you're thinking about deploying new technologies. So in terms of those kind of three findings, again, the, the things that I see connections to nuclear, but I welcome kind of your questions or observations. In terms of landscape fit, um, I think advanced nuclear has the benefit over renewables in terms of footprint that it could um, fit on the footprint of existing or past power plants. These are places that the community like has at least very recently seen as a landscape of energy production. And, you know, these are communities, particularly if there was a recent closure where there's an economic hole to fill. I would caution, though, in just assuming that the community always wants that site to be one of energy production. Um, they might have other goals. I mean, I can think of places here um, in this region where coal or, or gas plants are closing at, along, you know, the lake shore or kind of along riverbanks. And, you know, those communities want that to be, they want to activate that shoreline. Um, or that they want to see, they, you know, the community might see that old industrial site uh, um, as an opportunity for environmental remediation to kind of right some of the past environmental harms. The second kind of takeaway um, about communicating benefits, the local benefits and impacts and not kind of overselling um, is that you, like, I would really think about hyper-local. So effectively, like, why would a community want advanced nuclear in their backyard? Um, if there's going to be jobs generated, you need to think, and, you know, long-term operations jobs generated, that's great, but you also need to think, like, do they have a program in place in the community college or, you know, um, based on kind of this, the existing skills to be able to fill <laughs> those positions with locals? Like, this is the kind of thing that I think um, will be really important to set, to set yourself up for success, um, especially for the first few projects, I think it's going to be really important, like not to oversell benefits <laughs> um, or, or kind of undersell what potential um, impacts could be, like to be realistic about those. And then on the procedural justice, I kind of already highlighted this. I think community engagement is going to be really important. Um, this is true when you're deploying any new, especially true when you're deploying a new technology, because all eyes are going to be on that project. And every, if you want to refer people to the first couple of projects to get host, other host sites, like how people felt, whether they felt like um, the local government or the energy developer forced this upon a neighborhood that didn't want it is going to be really important. So making sure that there is kind of widespread community engagement, I think, will set the entire industry up for success. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. And I think you alluded to this, but I want to connect something you said to something David said about trust being fragile. I mean, have you seen similar things where it's going fine and then developers or operators do something and they lose the community trust? Yeah, uh, the, um, the most... A vivid example in my mind is um, uh, it was actually developers following tax law. So the ta how wind again for energy de for wind and solar development, like the primary benefits are economic. Um, and in Michigan, um, uh, there's property taxes on wind and solar that go to local governments, and that's an important part of the discussion when communities are deciding how to host them. The state changed the tax table, which reduced. The wind developers tax bills and the the um the local governments were effectively charging the original higher tax bills and the wind developer said no we don't the state's not making us pay this like we're not going to pay more taxes than we need to and effectively challenged those tax like those tax assessments in court and it it completely poisoned the well this community felt like whether it's true or not that the developer 
asked for a change in the state tax structure, like that they were promised this and that they weren't willing to uphold their end of that the developer promised these taxes and they weren't willing to uphold the, their end of the bargain, um, completely poisoned the well. So the state of Michigan extended a transmission line, five gigawatts of you know transmission, um, one gigawatt with, to a wind area. One gigawatt was built and effectively now there are ordinances that block any new wind development in this place where we have transmission, we have the wind resource, but you know, um, there's not trust anymore in, in not just that developer, but the industry in general. Yeah, David, I see you have a, a question or a comment. Yeah, thank you very much. So I wanted to make two comments or questions.